Through the process of moving, we found a variety of family heirlooms. And I'm holding one of them in my hand right now. I was showing this to George, there's George, George Hodge, and he Im immediately said, military. <laughs> he recognized this. He said, that is a military uh, Bible, testament, or songbook, something like that. And indeed, I, I opened it up. Now, it, it's a little challenging to figure out exactly what this is, because it is written in Norwegian. Uh, and I learned some things about my grandfather that I didn't know. In fact, even this morning, I learned something new, which I didn't know. I'm told I was named after my grandfather, and uh, they called him Eric. And as I was looking today at the inscription of his name, it's Ernst Eriksson. And my mother's name was always spelled E-R-I-C-K-S-O-N. So I always wondered, now, OK, so my name is spelled E-R-I-K. So why was I, why was I named E-R-I-K if my mother's maiden name was E-R-I-C-K-S-O-N, or if I was named after my grandfather, who I assumed had the same spelling as my mother? Now, this is only a hypothesis, but as I looked at this Bible today, I saw that he's, it, it was spelled Ernst Eriksson, E-R-I-K-S-E-N. So, lots of questions. As I held this Bible in my hand, I, I often wondered, where has this Bible been? It's Norwegian. As I understand it, my father probably can tell more, but he served both in the Norwegian army as well as the U.S. army. I remember seeing a picture of him in uniform. I know Dad has met him. I only remember him very vaguely. He passed away when I think I was about three. So I do not have very vivid memories of him, but I, I know Dad talks about hearing classical music uh, when he first visited uh, my grandfather's house. And because he was able to tell my grandfather exactly what piece of music was playing on the record player, I think he got a few points, a few extra points. Uh, and uh, they were pretty happy uh, with his knowledge of music. Of course, my mother was a musician. The date of publication of this Bible is 1917. 100 years ago, did this Bible see, did he see uh, combat in World War II? I don't know. Or what offices, World War I for that matter? Uh, I don't know. But this book provides a story. It, 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 it almost raises more questions than can be answered. And just this last week, or a couple of weeks ago, I'm losing track of time, but had an opportunity to hear from uh, somebody on, our, on my father's side of the family who keeps track of genealogy, Anders Auckland. And he was saying that my great-grandfather, my dad's grandfather, was some kind of minister, or a, he, he said priest. I think he meant uh, uh, pastor. Looking back into uh, the past, looking back into the story of where we came from, 
wondering, did our fathers, did our grandfathers have faith? If so, how did their faith impact their lives? And we are affected by those who have gone before us. And we will indeed have impact on the current generations and future generations. We are coming to the final week of a series on Jeremiah. Yes, I know we flew through Jeremiah. We only spent a quarter on Jeremiah. But Jeremiah was largely written to a, during a time of turmoil, a time looking up to war, devastating war. When I look at some of the pictures from Europe during World War II, I, I see devastation. I see cities flattened, leveled, uh, uninhabitable. And I wonder how Jerusalem must have looked like after it was overtaken by the Babylonians in 586 BC. The destruction was thorough. The destruction was complete, utter devastation in Jerusalem. If you wish to follow along this morning, I will be reading from several parts of the Bible. Uh, Jeremiah 52 provides the main text for this evening, this morning. Jeremiah 52. Now, as part of a historical footnote, biblical footnote. So as you're turning to Jeremiah, I want you to put your finger or some marker in Jeremiah 52 and walk with me for just a moment or two to 2 Kings. You'll see why I'm bringing you there. 2 Kings chapter 25. Now, if your Bible is anything like mine, you will have certain headings on these chapters as you, as you have your fingers in these two chapters. You're going to notice that they are largely identical. You're going to see headings such as fall and captivity of Judah. You are going to see fall of Jerusalem recounted, temple burned, the people exiled to Babylon. And as you look at the paragraphs, you will see that, well, let me give you some examples here. Taking from uh, chapter 52, verse 1 in Jeremiah. So look at Jeremiah chapter 52, verse 1. I'll read a couple of verses. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. And he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. Stop. Turn back to 2 Kings chapter, it's actually 24, the end of 24. 2 Kings 24, verse 18. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. Does it sound familiar? If you were to go through these two chapters, you would see that they are almost word for word, with 
a very few exceptions. There are a few details which are different from chapter to chapter. But in essence, it is the same text. Now, this raises questions as well, which is worth some research uh, in a Bible dictionary or in commentaries. And I wish I could give you the answer. I don't know the answer. But this opens up all kinds of historical questions and avenues for historical exploration. When were these books put together? What was happening when 2 Kings was put together? Who put it together? Did the same person who put 2 Kings together put Jeremiah together? Lots of interesting questions. Then you ask the question, what was going on in Judah when these books were put together? And what had gone on in Israel, in the northern kingdom? And how did what happened in the northern kingdom under Assyria affect what happened in Judah? And then some hundred or so years after Assyria fell, then Judah was overtaken by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Lots of historical details and lots of details to keep track of. But it is really quite interesting to see how the story of Israel plays itself out. Each of us has a genealogy. Now, whether it's written down or not is, is another thing. Some of us have done the uh, ancestry uh, genealogy process and, and know from whence we have come. Uh, we know uh, if we are 10% this or 10% that or 50% this. For the Israelites, it was important to know the succession of kings and who was on the throne and who overtook Jerusalem. Now, Jeremiah chapter 52, if you wish to return back there, is what some commentators have called an epilogue. An epilogue. Now, an epilogue, what is an epilogue? Well, if you go to an English dictionary, it will say something like, it is a short section at the end of a literary or dramatic work, often discussing the future of its characters. It could be a closing section added to a novel or a play, providing further comment as a speech by an actor to the audience. So in essence, it's the ending of a story, and somebody tacks on some words at the end, or maybe there is a brief scene at the end where a character is revealed. Now, Tim would be much better at recounting this detail than I, but the last Star Wars, well, I, I don't even know if it is the last Star Wars. There may have been another Star Wars movie in the middle. Of, I'm sorry, Tim. Uh, there, and I don't even remember which Star Wars movie this was, but there, there was a Star Wars movie in Help Me, Tim, where it seems like after lots of journeys and lots of travels, they, they go to some planet and they, they trek through the wilderness forever and then they come to this cliff area and they find somebody and he's dressed in some kind of cloak and you can't see his head and then he turns around, you see who it is, it's Luke Skywalker. And then the movie ends and you say, Oh no, this means, well, or, or yay, this means there's going to be another Star Wars movie. It's like, oh no, I, or, or oh yes, <laughs> I get to see another movie. But it's, it, uh, in movies such as the Star, Star Wars movie, you have different powers that are coming. You have dark powers and light powers. Well, I don't know if the 
uh, authors or screen writers of the Star Wars movies consulted Jeremiah at all, but we see here in chapter 52 of Jeremiah a similar epilogue. Now, this final chapter of Jeremiah, it essentially affirms two things. Are you ready with your pens? Are you ready for the answer for what chapter 52 talks about? It's the following. Number one, the word has been fulfilled. The word has been fulfilled. Number two, the word will be fulfilled. The word will be fulfilled. Jeremiah 22 affirms that things turn out as God promises. As you look at this story, the authors spare no detail about the absolute and total devastation that the Babylonians bring on the city of Jerusalem. Let's pick it up in verse 12 of chapter 52 of Jeremiah. In the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, that was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard who served the king of Babylon, entered Jerusalem, and he burned the house of the Lord, and the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. And all the army of the Chaldeans, who were with the captain of the guard, broke down all the walls around Jerusalem. And Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive some of the poorest of the people and the rest of the people who were left in the city and the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon together with the rest of the artisans. But Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. And the pillars of bronze that were in the house of the Lord, and the stands, and the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried all the bronze to Babylon. And they took away the pots, and the shovels, and the snuffers, and the basement, and the basins, and the dishes for incense and all the vessels of bronze used in the temple service, also the small bowls, and the fire pans, and the basins, and the pots, and the lampstands, and the dishes for incense, and the bowls for drink offerings. You get the idea that they did a thorough job in taking everything away, destroying the walls, destroying Jerusalem, what was of gold, the captain of the guard took away as gold. What was of silver, as silver. As for the two pillars, the one sea, the twelve bronze bowls that were under the sea, and the stands which Solomon the king had made for the house of the Lord, the bronze of all these things was beyond weight. As for the pillars, the height of the one pillar was 18 cubits, its circumference was 12 cubits, and its thickness was four fingers, and it was hollow. On it was a capital of bronze. The height of one capital was five cubits. A network of pomegranates. All the bronze were around the capital. And the second pillar had the same with pomegranates. These were not, there were 96 pomegranates on the side. All the pomegranates were 100 upon the network all around. As I was reading this, I was thinking, why? <laughs> why go through such detail? Why go through such exquisite pains? to say the shovels, the snuffers, the pans, the pots, the pomegranates, the bowls, everything was taken away to Babylon. Well, you 
conclusion that I've come to and what others, other commentators have come to is that this shows the finality of God's judgment on his people. Whereas the temple was where God met his people. In essence, the destruction of the temple, the destruction of the city of Zion was breached, walls torn down, everything was destroyed, burned, desecrated completely. The Lord's word has been fulfilled. It takes going back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. If you wish to turn to Deuteronomy, I wish to read to you what God's covenant was with his people. Deuteronomy 29. In this, in this passage, the covenant is renewed. And during this renewal of the covenant, the stipulations of the covenant were made very clear. Let's start with verse 10 of chapter 29. He says, You are standing today, all of you, before the Lord your God, the heads of your tribes, your elders and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the sojourner who is in your camp, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water, so that you may enter into the sworn covenant of the Lord your God, which the Lord your God is making with you today that he may establish you today as his people, and that he may be your God as he promised you, and as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. It is not with you alone that I am making this sworn covenant, but with whoever is standing here and with us today before the Lord our God, and whoever is not here with us today. And he then goes into great detail about how God brought his people out of the land of Egypt into the promised land. Verse 16, you know how we lived in the land of Egypt, how we came through the midst of the nations through which he passed and you have seen their detestable things, their idols of wood and stone, of silver and gold, which were among them. Beware lest there be among you a man or woman or clan or tribe whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations. Beware lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit, one who, when he hears the words of this sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. This will lead to the sweeping away of moist and dry alike. The Lord will not be willing to forgive him, but rather the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will smoke against that man. And the curses written in this book will settle upon him. And the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. And the Lord will single out from all the tribes of Israel for calamity in accordance with all the curses of the covenant written in this book of the law. And the next generation, your covenant that I made with them, then my anger will be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them and hide my face from them, and they will be devoured. It goes on and on. As many evils and trouble and many evils and troubles will come upon them, so they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us. And I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil that they have done, because they have turned to other gods. In Jeremiah 52, we see the end result of God's people hardening their hearts against God. 
And God brings against them the judgment that Jeremiah proclaimed through the reigns of several kings. It came, while not quickly, once it came, it came with a vengeance. Uh, God reached out to his people, and yet they turned away from him, and God ultimately brought his judgment, brought the curse that he foretold in the making of the covenant of Deuteronomy, chapter 29. So Jeremiah 52, number one, the word has been fulfilled. He goes into exquisite detail about how God's promise that the city of Jerusalem would be destroyed, that the temple would be torn down, it has been fulfilled. Now you come to this ending paragraph in Jeremiah 52. We don't find Luke Skywalker at the end of the chapter, but you find someone else. You find Jehoiachin. Jehoiachin. When we think of the great leaders of Israel, we, we don't often think Jehoiachin. But here he is at the end of the book of Jeremiah. 52, verse 31. And in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 25th day of the month, Evel Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, graciously freed Jehoiachin, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. And he spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above the seats of the kings who were there, or who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiachin puts off his prison garments. So Jehoiachin put off his prison garments, and every day of his life he dined regularly at the king's table. And for his allowance, a regular allowance was given him by the king, according to his daily needs, until the day of his death as long as he lived. Now, it, it seems a little abrupt to end this long book, this anthology of prophecies, which is the book of Jeremiah, with this story of Jehoiachin. It's, it's just a few verses right at the end. And it doesn't seem maybe as earth-shaking as it might have seemed to the early hearers of this book. Whereas Jerusalem had been destroyed, whereas God's people had been exiled, whereas it looked as if the enemies of Judah, the Babylonians, the fearsome Nebuchadnezzar, it looked like they had the upper hand. And there were many details shared in these chapters about how the forces of Nebuchadnezzar slaughtered many of the leaders of Judah. And yet, there is still hope. There is this glimmer of hope. There is, there is a king who is raised up. And there is hope that there once again will be a king in the house of David who will reign on the throne. The word will be fulfilled. God promised that he would bring his people into exile because they had turned away from the Lord. He says, but I will return you to the land of Israel. After 70 years of exile, you will come back. Now, the numbers are not great. I believe the numbers of people who were brought out at, into exile over several trips of exile were about 4,600. I think it says that in the scriptures. That doesn't sound like a whole lot of people. I mean, there, there are considerably more than 4,600 people just right here in Olney by quite a large factor. Uh, but from that small remnant came the chosen people of God. 
and then ultimately came our Redeemer. We look ahead to Jesus. We look ahead to another king who will take upon himself the curses of the law. Whereas we may have failed to live up to the righteousness of God, this king will become our righteousness. His righteousness will be credited to our account. So there is hope in the darkness of battle, in the devastation of war, in any of the turmoil that any of us might face. It may look like the forces of evil have won. It may look like our sins have caught up to us. It may look like our failures have destroyed the last bit of hope. But there is always hope. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Just as God has been faithful in the past, he has fulfilled his word, so he will fulfill his promises to us. And one day we will see him face to face as we put our trust in him. We did a whirlwind study through Jeremiah. It seems as if we just began it. But looking back at this old book and the prophecies there where it it may not be a book that we have done a lot of study uh, uh, in which we have done much study yet, we can gain encouragement from it. At a dark time of Israel, Jeremiah has a a lot of uh, sorrowful, lamentable things. But in there, there is hope. There is hope of a promise. I'd like to close today with some, a, a couple of verses from Lamentations. Now, Lamentations, of course, is a book that was written following the devastation of Jerusalem. It looked as if all hope had been lost. And this poem in Lamentations goes in exquisite detail about the lament of uh, of one who has endured the devastation of Jerusalem. But then you come to chapter 3. And we see that Though God's justice has been done, his judgment has been brought upon the city. And the author says uh, in verse 16 of Lamentations 3, He has made my teeth grind on gravel. He has made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance has perished. And so has my hope from the Lord. It seems as if all hope has been lost. It seems as if any hope for a better day is gone. He calls out to God, Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind. And therefore I have hope. In the depths of his his despair, he remembers that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. This is a song we sing, so that no matter what devastation, no matter what trials, no matter what hardship, no matter what difficulty we go through, there is hope. There is always hope because God's steadfast love never ceases. His word has been fulfilled and his word will be fulfilled. We can trust in him. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for Jeremiah, the prophet who is a faithful minister, a faithful servant of yours. 
And we thank you for the verses that he penned in such a tumultuous time of Israel over so many generations. We pray, O oh God, that the message that he recorded in that day may indeed minister to our hearts that we can put our hope in you, that we can know that our Redeemer lives. Search us, O oh God, and know our hearts. Try us and know our anxious thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in us, and lead us in the way everlasting. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The invitation is always open to come to the Lord. Uh, time did not allow us to look at psalms such as Psalm 106. If you wish to, uh, in your own private devotions, look at a psalm of somebody uh, who has returned to the Lord after a time of exile, it is a very rich psalm. It is a psalm of thanksgiving. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, but it is a time of, it is after a time of repentance. It is a time of returning to the Lord. Uh, there are times when we need to be restored to the Lord to confess our sins. There are also times when we need to put our trust in the Lord and to be buried with him in baptism. And if you have not done that, now is the day. Now is the day to do that. We can always approach him in prayer. and We can always ask for his grace and mercy to face the things that we face. And if there are any particular prayers that we can offer on your behalf, please make those known. Whatever your need might be, please make it known as we stand and sing.